Good afternoon. I think it's time to start. Uh, yes. Welcome everyone to this wonderful event. I would like to introduce and warmly welcome Professor Richard Davidson, who is regarded as one of the leading specialists in affective and contemplative neuroscience. Professor Davidson is the William James and Willis Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry and founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds and the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Throughout his career, he has published more than 375 articles, many chapters in books, and 14 separate books. From my personal opinion, I think that we can be grateful to him that meditation is an important and valid point of interest of contemporary science and medicine. It's a great honor to have you here today. And we are very grateful to have this opportunity to, s to spend this time with you today. So in order to maximize our opportunity, I will not waste any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Richard Davidson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of space up front, so maybe everyone can just hang out here. There's I, I feel that it's too spacious here and too crowded there. So maybe everyone, seriously, because it would be very uncomfortable to sit or to stand. So please, come. Please, everyone. Wonderful. There's room for many more, so. Okay. So uh, thank you all for coming this evening and it really is an honor for me to be here and uh, to be in this very auspicious location where some great scientific work ha was carried out. Uh, and also to hear a little bit about the uh, projects that are beginning in Bruno and in other parts of the Czech Republic using meditation and other practices to uh, cultivate well-being and to address specific disorders. It's really heartening to see this work spreading so widely. In the hour that we have together, I'm gonna tell uh, a little bit about the journey that we've been on. I am a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training. And when I began my career, I was interested in one particular question. And that question is one that still motivates a lot of our work. And the question was simply, why is it that some people are more vulnerable to life's challenges and other people are more resilient? And how can we nourish people on this continuum to enable them to flourish? And in the early part of my career, I focused a lot on the negative side of things, on adversity and stress and anxiety and fear and depression. And then in 1992, something really quite momentous happened to me, which is the time I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama challenged me and he said, why can't you use the same tools that you've been using to study stress and anxiety and adversity, why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and to study compassion? 
and I did not have a very good answer for him on that day, other than that it's hard. Um, but when we first began to study anxiety, it was hard too. And I think most scientists would agree that we've made at least a little bit of progress in understanding that. And that began this turn toward human flourishing. And then a few years later, I was with him on another occasion with the Dalai Lama, and he gave me a more specific assignment. He took me by the arm and pointed at me and said, I want you to take the practices from our tradition, turn them into a form that anybody feels comfortable doing, a kind of secular form, investigate them with the tools of modern science, and if you find them to be valuable, disseminate them widely. And that is the assignment for the rest of my life. And that is the journey that we're on. So I'd like to share a little bit about that journey with you, but let me just ask so I get a sense of the audience. How many of you in the audience are scientists or students of science? Okay, wonderful. Uh, and how many of you are meditators? And by meditators mean at least meditating five times a week. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, and how many of you are therapists or treat patients or care for um, people in those kinds of ways? Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, let me begin with an inspirational picture. Uh, this is a photograph of the Dalai Lama visiting our lab in 2001. He's been to Madison, Wisconsin on many occasions. Actually, he's been to Madison, Wisconsin 16 times since he's been in exile, which I think is the largest number of times he's ever been in a city under 500,000 that's outside of India. Um, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, really, we're so grateful for the time that he spent. Uh, and this is a time when we were first showing him functional MRI. Uh, I know that there are some folks here in the audience who do this kind of work. This was in 2001. It was sort of at the beginning of doing functional MRI. And um, uh, it was really exciting to be able to show His Holiness how functional MRI works. And we actually had a demonstration set up. Uh, I had a student lying in the scanner, and he was actually lying there for several hours because we were late in getting to the scanner because everything. So uh, uh, I, he was one of these people that felt quite comfortable and was able to lay there for several hours. And the demonstration that we had planned was a simple one. We we're going to ask him to do motor movements, just moving his fingers in his right hand, and you can see the left somatosensory cortex light up, and then moving fingers in his left hand, you can see the right somatosensory cortex light up. And we did that, and you can see on the computer monitor in real time these changes in the brain, and that was really exciting. And then His Holiness said, can I please ask him to do something? Uh, and we said, wow, of course you can ask him to do something. So His Holiness said, can you please imagine the fingers in your right hand moving, but don't actually move them. Just imagine in your mind. And of course, this was the beginning of research in this area. And actually, there had been a couple of studies published using imagery and uh, finding that the cortical regions that are involved in the sensory perception in those areas were activated purely in response to mental imagery. And we did this little experiment with His Holiness, and he was imagining the fingers moving, and we can actually see him in the scanner through the window and see that he was perfectly still. And yet we saw changes in the brain uh, that were associated with the imagination of these movements. And that was a momentous time for His Holiness because he saw 
that pure mental activity it w could be expressed in some way in changes in the brain. And that was really an important insight. Uh, so this was a, uh, a really momentous visit. I want to begin by talking about five or four themes briefly in modern science that have enabled this work to go forward. Uh, and I'll cover um, most of them quite briefly, and I'll say a little bit about a few of them in, a, in, in more detail. The first theme is something that I'm sure all of you have heard about, neuroplasticity, and it simply means that our brains are constantly being shaped by experience. Our brains are changing wittingly or unwittingly, that is intentionally or unintentionally, and most of the time our brains are being changed unintentionally. Most of the time our brains are being shaped by forces around us about which we're only dimly aware, if not completely unaware. And the invitation in this whole area is that we can all take more responsibility for our own brains and shape our brains in ways that promote well-being and flourishing. And I liken this to, to this. When human beings evolved on this planet, we didn't brush our teeth at the beginning. How many of you now brush your teeth every day? Well, I would like to invite the, the suggestion that our minds may be even more important than our teeth. And if we nurtured our minds in the same way that we care for our teeth, this world would be a different place. Even if we spent two or three minutes a day intentionally nurturing our minds. And so this is really a public health issue. And it's an issue which our planet depends on. And so neuroplasticity is simply the fact that our brains will change in response to experience and it will support enduring change that is a product of training. So the second theme that I'd like to suggest, which is particularly auspicious in this location, is what is the equivalent of neuroplasticity these days in the realm of genomics? And this is epigenetics. <clears throat> epigenetics is the science of how genes are regulated. And while we're all born with a fixed complement of base pairs, that is our DNA, and for the most part, that will not change over the course of a person's life. But what will change very dynamically is the extent to which a gene is turned on or turned off. We can think of genes having little volume controls that go from low to high. And the extent to which a gene is upregulated or downregulated very much depends upon our experience. For example, we know that a mother who is nurturing to her offspring induces an epigenetic change in the offspring that persists for the entire life of that, that individual. And these are hard-nosed data that are published in mainstream journals. We also know that these epigenetic changes can actually be passed down for at least a couple of generations. At one point, this sounded like very Lamarckian, but this stuff is real. And it's, it's published in the very best scientific journals in the world. And so we now have evidence to suggest that meditation and other kinds of mental training can induce epigenetic changes that are um, health promoting. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Sensitive periods. <clears throat> we know that while plasticity exists throughout life, there are certain periods that are particularly important in being especially 
sensitive to shaping, to plasticity. And these periods tend to occur early in life. <coughs> and there are three really important periods in early life that are these. One is the period up until birth, that is the prenatal period, particularly the second and third trimester of pregnancy and then the first month of life. The second period is around the onset of schooling between roughly the ages of four and seven years. And the third sensitive period is around adolescence. And there's a lot of reason to believe that if we can intervene during those sensitive periods, we can make a difference which is disproportionate to the amount of the intervention. That is, these can, be, these can have multiplicative effects as we develop. And I'll say a little bit more about that too as we go along. Um, the fourth theme is probably the most controversial but I think of all of these may be the most important, and that is that every human being comes into the world with innate basic goodness. I'll say it again. Every human being comes into the world with innate basic goodness. Now, I will show you evidence that I believe supports this claim, uh, it's a growing body of evidence, but the idea is that if an, an young individual is given a choice, she or he will choose a pro-social alternative compared to one that is selfish or aggressive. And so when we engage in certain kinds of meditation practices, that are designed to cultivate kindness and to cult cultivate compassion, we're not creating these from nowhere, but rather we're nurturing aspects of our mind that are there from the start. And in this sense, we can think of kindness and compassion in the same way that scientists think of language. We all know that we are born with a biological propensity for language. But that propensity requires that we be raised in a normal linguistic community. We know from case studies of feral children that if they're raised in the wild, they don't develop normal language. And this may also be true for kindness and for compassion. That these seeds, if you will, require nurturing. And when we do meditation practices to strengthen these qualities, that's a kind of nurturing that we can do to enable these qualities to strengthen and to flourish. Okay, so now I'll show you a little bit of evidence about two of these. Um, so this is a timeline of brain development in humans, and I just want to put this up here to show you that there are major changes that are occurring in the brain that, that persist at least into the 30s developmental changes. Uh, there are changes in myelination, for example, that go out into the 30s. We know that synapse overproduction goes through at least the teens. There's pruning in different cortical regions that occurs um, till uh, very late in development. And this is simply to make the point that although I'm going to talk a little bit now about early development. There's a lot happening uh, that goes into the 30s uh, that still is part of our basic maturational program. Um, so I'm going to now talk a little bit of more about neuroplasticity and epigenetics. Uh, and this is a figure from... Uh, uh, a paper that was published a few years ago, and I don't want to go into the details here because they're not that important, but what it talks about is PTG, stands for post 
post-traumatic growth. Uh, and PTSD, of course, is post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, I want to use this to make the simple point that the brain mechanisms that are hijacked by stress and by trauma are the same brain mechanisms that we can use to promote human flourishing and to promote awakening. It's the same neural systems. And basic mechanisms of plasticity are the same on both sides of the equation. And we can harness the plasticity of the brain to enable the brain to change for the better. And it turns out that there are kind of uh, resilience endophenotypes, that is, um, specific characteristics that enable a person to respond to a stressful or traumatic challenge in a way that actually promotes healthy functioning and does not lead to debilitating PTSD. And these are the kind of qualities which we think can be strengthened intentionally through mental training. A little bit about sensitive periods. Um, these are data just showing that adversity during pre-adolescent years, uh, in this case 10 or 11 years of age, predicts changes in brain volume that occur when an individual is in their 20s. These are, um, th and there is now several studies showing this basic fact. Uh, and it simply underscores the idea that events that occur early in life can have very important consequences for brain development later on. And we can again use the positive side of the equation to begin to nurture these positive qualities early in life and make a difference later in life as the individual develops. <coughs> Some of you may have heard of James Heckman, Jim Heckman. He uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics a number of years ago. And what he won the prize for is by showing that on average, based on data that exists, there's a 13% return on investment for interventions that uh, are deployed in the first five years of life. So what these data suggest is that when we have these early interventions, um, by the time the individual is 30 years of age, there's a return of 13% on the investment. Other findings in the scientific literature show that a child's capacity for self-regulation at five years of age, <coughs> excuse me, is a better predictor of young adult outcomes than IQ scores, socioeconomic status, and grades, including standardized tests, all put together. And these are hard-nosed findings from longitudinal studies that have been done. So let me just give you a specific example. If you look at people in the highest versus lowest quintile in measures of self-control at five years of age, it turns out that the individuals who are in the lowest level of self-control were 43%, 43% of those individuals when they're 32 years of age had an adult criminal conviction compared to those in the lowest quintile where 13% of this sample had an adult criminal conviction. So what these data are showing is that self-control at five years of age is predicting the likelihood of an adult criminal conviction at age 32. These are data that are uh, that come from a major longitudinal study that's been done in New Zealand where uh, a birth cohort of a thousand people have been followed. Uh, they're now in their late 40s. And this is a very famous study that has produced a whole series of important insights about the relationship between early life experience 
and later development. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit about innate basic goodness. Uh, I want to show you two very short video clips. Uh, these video clips were, sh were shown to six-month-old babies, and I'll show you them now. This is the first. Okay, that's the first one, and now the second one. Now, if we give these puppets to six-month-old babies, which puppet do you think the babies reach for? The generous one, who is the helper, or the hinderer? About 95% of babies will reach for the puppet that was helpful and not the one that was the hinderer. If it's a quick question, I'll answer it. If not, I won't. I don't know. It's not important. 95% though of the babies reach for the helper. So the, there's a whole genre of evidence like this that suggests that humans come into the world with this basic propensity for goodness. And we can use clever means to probe an infant's mind to determine what is going on and the, the evidence clearly suggests that there is this preference for pro-social activity, pro-social encounters. So I want to say a little bit about epigenetics now and just share with you two brief data points. Uh, and these come from studies that we ourselves have done uh, looking at very, <coughs> uh, in one case, very rapid epigenetic changes and in another case, something that's more enduring. So um, in the first study, which is displayed here, again, I won't bore you with all the details, but what we did in this study is we brought long-term meditators into the laboratory, and they came in for a day of intensive practice. These were all meditators who had at least a 10-year meditation practice, and they came in for eight hours of practice. We had a control group come into the lab for a day of leisure. These people had never meditated before, uh, and they were told that they were going to be in the lab the whole day. They were fed the same thing. There were some periods of walking, which the non-meditators did as well as the meditators. And we took blood samples before and after the eight hours. And we were specifically looking at epigenetic changes in genes that have been implicated in inflammation. And the reason we chose this is that there is a bunch of evidence that suggests that certain kinds of meditation may be anti-inflammatory, may actually decrease inflammatory mechanisms. And so we decided we would target genes that are specifically involved in inflammation. And this just gives an example of one gene, RIPK2. There's a whole slew of genes that are involved in the inflammatory cascade, the red lines are the meditators, the blue lines are the controls. T1 is in the morning when they first come in. T2 is after eight hours of meditation practice for the meditators or eight hours of spending a day of leisure in the lab for the non-meditators. And there are systematic changes in gene expression that we saw with these inflammatory genes. And it turns out that the magnitude of change correlates with changes in stress hormones in another part of the study, which I won't go into. In more recent work, we've taken the same group of people and we've asked the question as to whether uh, meditation may impact the epigenetic clock. Um, and w specifically looking at epigenetic signs of aging. It turns out that there are a series of epigenetic changes 
which occur as a consequence of aging. And if you look at the correlation between chronological age and epigenetic age, there's a very high correlation if you look across participants. But some, for some people, their biological machinery, their epigenetics are aging more quickly compared to their chronological age. And for other people, their biological machinery are aging more slowly compared to their chronological age. And we hypothesize that meditation may slow the epigenetic aging process. And so uh, what we, uh, I'll give you sort of the bottom line if you look at the, the figures in the middle. What you see is that there were actually no differences between the long-term meditators and the controls in epigenetic aging, if you just compare the two groups. However, if you look down at the bottom where we plot the number of years of meditation practice, what you see is that the longer people were meditating, the more change was observed in their epigenetic aging. So those people who are more long-term meditators showed uh, slower epigenetic aging. Uh, and so that we had people who were meditating 30 years here, and they show the slowest epigenetic aging among this group of long-term practitioners. So this, these are just examples of the fact that these practices seem to influence uh, our molecular machinery in very interesting ways and may produce some health-related consequences that are important. Okay, so um, we have an urgent need to disseminate these kinds of practices widely, I think, based on the data that we have, and I'll show you more data in a couple of moments, but I just want to set the kind of um, social context for this work. In the United States today, th these are data showing the percentage of youth between the ages of 12 and 17 who have experienced major depression in the last year. And what you can see is that in every age group, it's going up. And among uh, older teenagers, 16 to 17, the rates exceed 15% of the population. If you look by gender, you see that there's a huge gender difference. And uh, the rates among females are really high. They're approaching 20%. If you look at the number of suicides in the United States in teenagers, um, what you see is that the number of suicides uh, has been systematically increasing from 2007 to 2014, uh, the last year that there really is good reliable data. So there really is an urgent need to begin to address these issues. Um, most of you probably wouldn't recognize this person here in the Czech Republic in the United States. He's a very important person in science. He is the, his name is Tom Insel. He's the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He was director for 13 years. And I want to read to you uh, something that he recently said. He said, I spent 13 years at the National Institute of Mental Health really pushing on the neuroscience and genetics of mental disorders. And when I look back, I realize that while I think I succeeded in getting lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think $20 billion, I don't think we move the needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalizations, improving recovery for the tens of millions of people who have mental illness. I hold myself accountable. One of the things that Tom Insel is now suggesting is that the most effective way to change the brain is not through drugs, but actually through mental training. That if we want to really change the brain specifically in ways that endure, medication is not going to be the answer, at least for the foreseeable future. We can produce more specific biological changes through mental training than we can through any pharmaceutical. 
because pharmaceuticals have broad spectrum effects. That's why they have side effects. And I would invite the suggestion, even though there's been some reports of negative effects of meditation, the side effects of meditation pale in comparison to those of medication. Okay, so I'm now going to spend the rest of my time uh, talking about four components of well-being uh, that we think uh, are critical and that represent a framework that we are organizing a lot of work in our center around. These four components of well-being were specifically selected based on two major criteria. One was that they have scientific evidence supporting them. And the second is that they're deeply informed by the contemplative traditions as being key to transforming uh, our minds, uh, and I should say also our bodies. So let me walk you through these four components. I'm first going to tell you what each of the four are, say a little bit about them, and then we're going to take a much deeper dive into a few of them where I'll share some, um, some more evidence. The first component of well-being we call awareness. And this is where some of you would, I know that there are people in the audience who study mindfulness. We actually, for a variety of reasons, um, try not to use the word mindfulness that often. We certainly use it, but we prefer uh, the, the term awareness for a variety of reasons. Uh, but this would include the practices that would be done as part of traditional mindfulness training and what they strengthen are the capacity to pay attention, to focus attention, also self-awareness, very importantly, meta-awareness. Meta-awareness is knowing what your mind is doing. How many of you think you know what your minds are doing? <laughs> I mean, most of us actually just assume that that's kind of a stupid question, that of course we know what our minds are doing. But really, I, how many of you have had the experience of reading a book where you're turning the pages and actually reading the words, but then after a few pages you have no friggin' idea what you've read? Your mind is somewhere else. We, we, the, 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 the fact that we don't know what our minds are doing and we're unaware of that almost by definition means that we are not aware of what our minds are doing a lot of the time. And one of our central contentions is that if we're going to transform our minds, we need to know what our minds are doing. That's an essential ingredient. It's not sufficient, but we think it's necessary. And so meta-awareness is actually knowing what your mind is doing. So I can just to give you a feel for how this is studied in a hard-nosed way, I can bring you into the laboratory and I can construct a task that's difficult where people will make mistakes. And I can guarantee you that some of the mistakes you make, you will not be aware of. So you'll be doing a task, you'll be making mistakes, and you will not be aware that you're making the mistake. Now, at a very basic level, you can't correct a mistake if you're not aware that you've made the mistake. So meta-awareness is essential for optimal functioning. And yet, we really have not, I think, paid sufficient attention to it, but practices which cultivate <coughs> awareness, again, the rubric of mindfulness, are practices that strengthen meta-awareness. Okay, the second constituent of well-being is connection. And connection here refers to those qualities which facilitate successful interpersonal and social relationships. Qualities like appreciation and gratitude and kindness and empathy and also maintaining a positive outlook. And again, these are all qualities which we know can be strengthened, we know can be trained, and we know something about the brain circuits that are associated with them. The third constituent of well-being we call insight. 
Now, this is a really important one and requires a little bit of explanation. All of us carry around in our head a narrative about who we think we are. At the very extreme end of the distribution, we have people who have a lot of negative self-beliefs and who hold those beliefs to be a veridical description of who they are. Those people end up being depressed. In fact, it's um, one of the core symptoms of depression is, is that. A healthy sense of self is one where we change our relationship to that narrative and we understand the narrative for what it is. The narrative is a constellation of thoughts and so part of well-being is, is developing a healthy relationship to this narrative. It's not so much changing the narrative. It's not so much fixing anything. It's really about changing our relationship to this narrative so that we can see it for what it is. It's just a bunch of thoughts. And in cognitive therapy, it's often referred to as decentering. So <clears throat> this is very much part of cognitive therapy. So the fourth constituent of well-being is purpose. It's having a, a kind of true north toward which our life is directed, a clear direction, a sense that life has meaning. Now all of these Domains of well-being have specific meditation practices that are associated with them. One of the great practices for purpose is to spend a few moments and think of today as the last day of your life. And reflect on how that the, how that contemplation might bring into relief the clear direction and purpose in your life. And we can do those practices and strengthen these qualities in a very reliable way. Okay, so let's now take a deeper dive and look more specifically at some of these. And I should just ask, what time do, what, do we have to go till? Six? Whatever. Well, that's, that's very dangerous. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do some online editing here. Okay. So the first constituent is awareness. And I'd like to share with you findings from a recent study. Well, a study was published a number of years ago. Um, actually, before I get to that, uh, let me say a few things about um, uh, what we've learned about awareness <coughs> from a neuroscientific perspective. One of the <coughs> strategies that we took in our own work after these encounters with His Holiness the Dalai Lama was to bring very long-term practitioners into the laboratory. These are people who, whose day job it is to meditate. What a cool job it is. Um, so one of those people is this person here. Uh, his name is Mingyur Rinpoche. He's a famous young Tibetan Lama. Uh, he's about 42 years old now, uh, and he's spent more than 10 years of his life, more than a, about a quarter of his life in full-time retreat. Uh, uh, and his, he has more than 65,000 hours of formal lifetime practice. You can go do the arithmetic at home, but that's a big number. Um, uh, and so he's been one of the practitioners that we've had come to the lab. And uh, one of the things that we saw in Mingyur Rinpoche and in other long-term practitioners who've had similar experience is that when we recorded their brain electrical activity, when they were doing a practice that they call essentially open awareness. And for those of you who are accustomed to mindfulness practice, this would be equivalent to meditating without an object, uh, 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 to um, uh, 
not have any specific object of focus and to simply be aware of whatever it is that happens to enter into the mind, whether it's a thought, a feeling, uh, a sensation from the outside. All channels are open uh, and there's complete total attentiveness to the panorama, uh, the panorama of awareness, whatever enters internally or externally. So when they did this practice, what we saw, which is the first time anyone had ever reported it, are these very high amplitude gamma oscillations. This had never before been seen <coughs> in the human EEG. Uh, and these were very widespread. Uh, and there was, they were also synchronized across many different cortical regions. And this paper was published in 2004 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This is the first time that a paper on meditation had ever appeared in this journal, which is a very um, august journal in the history of science. And that really cracked this whole area open. If you look at uh, a figure of publications on meditation in the scientific literature, there's an inflection point at around 2005. Uh, and, um, you know, without being promoting our own work, uh, we think that this, the science that was in this paper had something important to do with that. So now let me say a little bit more about attention. Uh, and I want to share with you a quote um, that uh, was written by William James, the f America's first great psychologist. He wrote a two-volume text in 1890 called The Principles of Psychology. And in that text, he has a whole chapter on emotion, on, on attention. He also has a chapter on emotion. But th the chapter on attention had the following in it. He said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compo sui if he have it not. An education which should promote this faculty would be the education par excellence. And then he went on to say, it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. I think if William James had more contact with the contemplative traditions from the East, he would have instantaneously seen, or I should also say for that matter, contemplative traditions from the West too. He would have instantaneously seen that these traditions have at their core methods to educate attention. <coughs> and this is something that we've learned a lot about. We know that attention can be educated. And in my view, it's scandalous that we don't incorporate this into our into schools where we teach our children because attention is the building block for all other forms of learning. If you're not attending to what's being presented, it will compromise your ability to learn. So there was a study done in the US a number of years ago that was published in a very prestigious journal that took advantage of the fact that almost everyone these days is carrying around a smartphone. And what they did in this study is they asked people three questions by texting them at several points a day. The first question is, what are you doing right now? And they had to check off from a list of activities. Second question, where is your mind right now? Is it focused on what you're doing or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question <coughs> was right at this very moment, right now, how happy or unhappy are you right now? And so here's what they learned from this study. The average American adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. 47% of the time. <coughs> I don't know how this would come out in the Czech Republic, uh, but uh, I suspect it's probably somewhere similar. Uh, and uh, my conjecture is that we could do better. Even if we did a little bit better, just imagine 
on what the consequences would be if a teacher were really present with the children, if a physician was really showing up for her or his patients, if a parent was really attentive and fully engaged with their children. Just imagine how the world would be different if we really showed up for every encounter. The 47% figure is pretty devastating, but uh, again, I think we could all do better. Now, one other interesting fact about this study is that when people were asked that third question, how happy or unhappy are you, <coughs> it turns out that when people were distracted, when their mind was elsewhere, they reported themselves to be systematically less happy than when they were paying attention, even if what they were doing was boring, even if what they were doing was like cleaning their house or washing the dishes. Being distracted is toxic. And this reminds me of a story that I'll share with you. <coughs> a, a wonderful story about a time I was with the Dalai Lama at his residence in Dharamsala, India. And I found myself together with him with just one other person in the room, and it was a Japanese scientist who I had just met. Very unusual guy. And this was the first time this Japanese scientist had ever met the Dalai Lama. And the three of us were alone together in a room. And the Japanese scientist leaned over and said, asked the Dalai Lama a question that most people wouldn't have the nerve to ask him. <coughs> the Japanese scientist said, Your Holiness, can you please tell me the time in your life when you were the most happy? And I thought, wow, that's an interesting question. I just couldn't imagine what the Dalai Lama would say. And he said, I think right now. <laughs> so that is a possibility. OK. I'm going to skip a bunch of things. Uh, I'll just share with you a little bit of new data. This is very new. Um, I mentioned this to folks earlier today when we were having some coffee. Uh, uh, these are, um, I've been very skeptical myself that there, there have been a number of reports of structural changes in the brain um, with meditation practice, particularly among novices, among real beginners. I have no problem believing that people who have been meditating a long time are going to have structural changes, but just with eight weeks of practice, I was kind of skeptical. Um, and one report in the literature suggested that there were decreases in the volume of the amygdala. This is a, um, uh, a coronal image. So if you slice the brain this way, like just in front of your ears, and opened it, uh, what you would see in this portion of the medial temporal lobe uh, is the amygdala. We have an amygdala on each side of the brain. And the amygdala does many different things. It's, it's um, really important for uh, labeling uh, stuff that is salient, uh, emotionally salient. And, it, and it's been also implicated in fear and stress, uh, but it's involved in emotion more generally. Uh, and these investigators found that uh, among people who went through mindfulness-based stress reduction, those who reported the biggest decrease in perceived stress also showed a decrease in amygdala volume. And um, what we found is that similar to this previous study, we didn't find overall differences between the people who went through MBSR and the people who were in a very carefully matched comparison group. But what we did see is that people who reported more minutes of home practice with MBSR had a smaller uh, right amygdala particularly. Th their amygdala volume uh, was diminished, uh, particularly on the right side. Uh, and so these data are quite interesting. Uh, you know, it's one of many studies. The findings are still not completely consistent in the scientific literature. But the amygdala is an interesting part of the brain. And one of the reasons it's so interesting 
is if you look at the pattern of anatomical connectivity in the amygdala, this is what you see. It is, it is just connected to almost every other brain region. Uh, and every pathway in this diagram is anatomically verified. That is, this is an actual anatomical connection that's been verified using careful neuroanatomical tracing techniques. And so uh, these are not hypothetical, but these are actual verified anatomical connections. And some of them are really interesting, so I'll just point out one. The amygdala is in the middle here. This is V1. That's the first cortical relay station for visual information. And so what it's, and, and the back projection from the amygdala to V1 is particularly pronounced. And what it suggests is that this is a way that the amygdala can bias uh, information that's coming up through the visual pathway at a very early stage. And so if we can influence amygdala function, or in this case amygdala structure, we can really make a difference in how information is being perceived. Okay, I'm gonna skip another bunch of slides now, just pardon me, um, and I'll move to connection very briefly. So connection, as I said, is about the qualities which promote successful social relationships, qualities like kindness and compassion. And I just wanna give you, uh, show you the data very, very briefly from a study we published a few years ago where we took people who've never meditated before and randomly assigned them to a condition where they received training in compassion and another condition that came from cognitive therapy where they were trained to reappraise the causes of events to be uh, less negative and more positive. And we scanned these people before and after just two weeks of training two weeks, 30 minutes a day, a total of seven hours of training. And uh, in order to examine the behavioral consequences of compassion training, we used economic decision-making tasks. These come from behavioral and neuroeconomics. These are tasks that use real monetary payoffs and involve looking at altruistic behavior, costly altruism where a person behaves pro-socially and actually loses money, real money, and in, in certain cases, substantial money in the process. And so this is a way that scientists are using now to look at generosity in a very real um, economic decision-making framework. And so what we found is that after two weeks of training, let me just, after two weeks of training, people who were assigned to the compassion group actually uh, are behaving more pro-socially. They were uh, more generous and altruistic on this economic decision-making task compared to individuals who were assigned to the cognitive reappraisal condition that came from cognitive therapy. We also found that there are systematic changes in the brain and that these changes in the brain actually predicted a person's behavior on the economic decision-making task. Uh, this is a pathway from the prefrontal cortex to the ventral striatum, particularly the nucleus accumbens. And the, the connectivity is strengthened by compassion training. And the magnitude of strengthening actually predicts the extent to which people behave generously, altruistically, on this economic decision-making task. And so these findings suggest that doesn't take a lot of training. In this case, it was seven hours of training to produce a measurable change in the brain and a measurable change in behavior. Okay, I wanna just show you some other really new data. This is fun stuff. Um, so one of the things that we've done in the course of studying long-term meditation practitioners, not monks, but people who's, who have real day jobs, but who do a lot of meditation on the side, is we simply took photographs of these people. And um, <coughs> what we decided to do is recently is we have a bunch of these photographs and then we gave them to hundreds of people and we just asked them to rate these photographs and we gave them to meditation teachers, but we also gave them to just ordinary people off the street. Turns out it doesn't matter. But I'd like to just go through a couple of these just and we'll do it with you. I want you to just tell me quickly 
which one is the meditator, the one on the left or the one on the right? Left or right? Who's the... Okay. Left or right? So it turns out that when we gave these pictures to hundreds of people, hundreds, this, and we asked them to make these ratings, <coughs> the LTM stands for long-term meditator. The long-term meditators were rated as being more comfortable, more conscientious, more mindful, and less neurotic. Just based on seeing a photograph for 500 milliseconds, a half a second, that's how what we exposed them. 500 milliseconds. So there's something in the, the quality of the face, the demeanor, that may be informative about well-being. And actually, we're now engaged in a whole series of dialogues with Apple. Those of you who have an iPhone 10 know that your phone opens by your face. The average person opens their face 200 times a day. Um, <coughs> it was a lot of data. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we think we can actually tell something about your well-being from your face based on these kind of data. And so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip this and just talk a little bit about insight and a little bit about purpose, and then I'll end. Um, so insight, as I mentioned, is uh, about insight into the narrative that we have about ourselves. And one of the conjectures that we have is that when a person develops some insight, they will be less sticky in their demeanor. Now, what do we mean by stickiness? Stickiness refers to having emotions perseverate beyond the time where they're useful. So let me give you an example. Imagine that at this time point three, some stressful event occurs. And this is the time course of your, your change in some behavioral or physiological system. It doesn't really matter what it is. We've measured this in many different ways. We've measured it in cortisol. We've measured it in uh, autonomic nervous system function. We've also measured it directly in neural systems using fMRI. So I want to contrast this person with a second person who shows the same amplitude of response, but this second person recovers more quickly. This is the very definition of resilience. Resilience can be defined as the rapidity with which you recover from adversity. And those people who recover more quickly are more resilient. And it turns out this is a big predictor of well-being and really important. So I want to give you um, show you data from a study that we published a few years ago with physical pain. And what we did in this study is the pain was heat. And it was a very simple study. We gave people an experience of how damn painful this stimulus was. It was really painful, but safe, just on the border. Uh, and what we did in this experiment is after giving people an experience of this, we told them, we, they come into the lab, and they get a tone, and when they receive a certain tone, they know that in 10 seconds, they're going to get zapped with this very painful stimulus. And then there's another 10 seconds of recovery. That's basically the experiment. So we brought very long-term meditators into the lab and controls, and I want to show you what happens. So um, here's the tone. And that, th that's where the heat comes on. And this is a long-term meditator. And the pain network is a specific network in the brain that we measure with fMRI. So when the pain comes on, there's a big response. But there's no response during this anticipation period after the tone. The brain is flat there. And then... They show this big response, and then they rapidly come down to baseline, and during the recovery period, they're all the way down. Here's what a control subject shows. The tone comes on telling them that they're about to get a pain, but they've just heard beep. That's it. Their pain network <laughs> just goes up, stays up, 
and recovers very slowly. <coughs> That's what the data show. These are big differences. And in essence, the control subject is getting three times the amount of pain. Their pain network is activated so much longer. And they, that really is what's accounting for suffering. And so this ability to show non-stickiness, to respond appropriately. And in fact, the long-term meditators in certain parts of the pain matrix actually show significantly larger responses during the pain itself. They're not blunting it at all. Their channels are totally open. But they recover instantaneously. When the pain goes off, they come right back down to baseline. Whereas the non-meditators are worrying about the next time they're going to get zapped. They can't turn it off. So this is really important. And this is about stickiness about resilience and fundamentally about insight. And when we have insight into the nature of the self, it dramatically impacts this quality of stickiness. Okay, let me now just end with purpose. Um, this is really a beginning of scientific literature, but it turns out, and I'll just show you one data point here, it turns out that um, this is a study that was done looking at people who were in their 70s and 80s. And it's showing people who are in the 90th percentile in purpose in life and those who are in the 10th percentile. And this is looking at the hazard ratio for death. And it turns out that people who have a strong sense of purpose live longer. Those are the ones who are in the 90th percentile. Whereas those who are in the 10th percentile end up dying sooner. And it turns out that purpose in life is the single strongest psychological predictor of mortality when a person is in their 70s or 80s compared to every other variable that's been examined. And this is after carefully controlling for medical history and um, uh, current medical problems. Purpose in life is, is really important. So uh, I will just end by suggesting one other thing, and that is one of the things that the Dalai Lama always reminds us of when we're, wi when we're with him is in his characteristic way, he says, there are seven billion people. And emphasizing that we need to bring this to scale. And uh, it's difficult challenge to do this at scale. And it's very clear that if we're going to bring it to scale, we're going to have to, for better or for worse, use technology. It's the only way we're going to bring this to scale. And so we've been tinkering in our center with um, putting this, uh, uh, some of this, this whole f framework for well-being on a digital platform. Uh, and we're, uh, we're doing this in an initiative that we call the Healthy Minds Initiative. Uh, and uh, it is a set of practices and scientific information around this whole framework of these four constituents of well-being. Um, uh, they're very short practices. They can be done in groups. They can be done alone. And most importantly, they can be done while you're doing other activities of daily living. So we actually have people working with this program in a mode where they don't take a single minute out of their daily lives to meditate. They simply nominate activities of daily living that are not cognitively demanding, like commuting, cleaning your house, doing the laundry. And during these activities, they're engaged in guided practices. And we don't know from a scientific perspective if these are going to be as valuable as sitting formally, but it's never been tested. And we want to test this at scale, and this is one of the ways to do it. So we're engaged in this large initiative now, and um, we'll hopefully have some data in the next couple of years. So I want to just end now with uh, 
a quote from the Dalai Lama. This was from a book he wrote that was on the bestseller list for a while in the US uh, called The Art of Happiness. And His Holiness said, the systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately focusing, selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Should we do questions? So I'm happy to take a few questions for those who might have them. Yes, please. There's a microphone for you. I, um, uh, thank you very much. I was very much impressed by, uh, by your presentation. Just my feeling is that the things are much more complex. We are studying, uh, in particular in the, uh, referring to the last slide, the old persons. We have a three generation Holocaust survivor study and we are, when we are looking on Holocaust survivors, now 80, 90 years old, so they have higher PTSD level and higher post-traumatic growth. They are less depressed and clear structural changes in the brain as compared to the, uh, to the uh, control group, but not in amygdala. So uh, I think it is hardly possible to, to, to say it is just purpose or any other thing that shape the, the brain of the old people. Yeah, I, well, I completely agree with you. I, I think it is very complicated, and, um, uh, and that's why we still need to continue to do scientific research. So uh, uh, I appreciate that, and I certainly didn't mean to convey that we really had any answers at this point, really more questions. But the one thing that I think we can say with confidence from science is that well-being can be learned. And that, I think, is the most important conclusion. The rest is still to be investigated, how to do it, what's best for one person versus another. All those things need to be worked out. But I would go to the mat with any scientist, and I, will, uh, I believe we can win the argument that well-being can be learned. That's incontrovertible. And if that's true, we have a moral obligation to do everything we can to cultivate it and promote those practices widely because this is a very critical time for the world. And uh, I think that we all have a, res those of us who believe that have a responsibility. Professor Davidson, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your enlightening talk. I suppose I have a similar question. Um, I, I have a bit of Zen training. You have a? A bit of Zen training. Training in Zen, Zen, training, Zen yes. Buddhism. And I'm familiar with the Zen background of being a very unhappy one. And the fact is that even though those monks, and I suppose, excuse me, I'm nervous and my <laughs> voice is shaking. Ah. I know that um, there is this unhappy side of monks and meditators that their lives can be deeply dark. So what is the other side of awareness, mindfulness training and meditation? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for asking that. Um, you know, uh, in the in these traditions, it's said that samsara, which is suffering, and nirvana, enlightenment, are inextricably interwoven. Uh, and so I think that suffering exists all over. And uh, being a monk 
doesn't free you from suffering. Uh, uh, and so uh, one of the things that we often see is that when you bring awareness to your mind, particularly in the early stages of practice, it often is the case that you end up feeling worse, um, which actually is a sign of progress. It's actually a good thing um, because you're actually becoming more aware of all the, 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 the junk in your mind, uh, all the conditioning. Uh, we are so pulled by external circumstances that we devote so little time to really inspecting our own minds. And that sometimes when we begin to inspect our minds, we're, we're just freaked out by what we see because it's so chaotic. And so, you know, as Mingyur Rinpoche often says to me, the road to Lhasa goes up and down. Uh, and what he means by that is, yeah, there's going to be lots of suffering on the way. That's just part of the path. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, since you didn't use the mic, just let me repeat the question. So the question is about uh, personality disorders, which some have described as, quote, unchangeable. And have we applied any of these methods to those kinds of populations? Um, we certainly have studied um, patients with various kinds of disorders. We've done a lot of work uh, with depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. We have not done work specifically with personality disorders. Um, uh, the idea that people have referred to personality disorders as unchangeable, frankly, to me, is um, drives me nuts when I hear that. And the reason is, is because what's the evidence that they're unchangeable? I mean, have we really tried to change them in a in a rigorous, systematic, and intensive way. Um, uh, and so, you know, I know of work that's going on now in the U.S. with psych psychopaths, who are a group that also has been described as, quote, unchangeable. Uh, and it's a, it's a program that's using really intensive treatment, where basically it's 24-7, because there, this is being done in an inpatient unit and everyone is being everyone who sees them is rigorously trained, and it's basically a kind of dialectical behavior therapy sort of strategy, um, which includes a lot of contemplative components, uh, and um, uh, and there is some promise that has been reported clinically, and I think that you know with any disorder that we think is quote unchangeable. Um, I always ask, well, what's the evidence for that? And, and have we really tried something intensive? Now, we need to do it. And it may be that we're going to, I'm sure we're going to confront all kinds of challenges. But it reminds me that there is a famous study that was done uh, by a neuroscientist in the U.S. with stroke patients who had a hemiparesis, who were completely paralyzed on one side, and um, many of the people who are in this study were paralyzed for more than 10 years before they entered the study. And it took two years to get human subjects approval to do this study. But what they did in this study is they paralyzed the good side of their body in a whole body cast for 16 weeks. So they completely immobilized the good side of their body. And these were patients who had hemiparesis for some, in some cases, more than 10 years, two-thirds of the patients showed dramatic improvement. Dramatic. Uh, and so this is a case of um, really unorthodox and very intensive kind of treatment. And I th my conjecture is that for certain kinds of personality disorders, it's going to take, you know, a really dramatic, intensive kind of intervention. Uh, but until that's done and evaluated, I, for one, will never accept the, the premature conclusion 
that they're unchangeable. Yes. Okay. <laughs> My name is Katka Shirdova. I'm from Brno. And uh, I want to just thank you first for the beautiful lecture. And uh, I would like to say, I would like to confirm one thing which you were saying by our own research. I have similar experiences. You are being taught some Eastern techniques by a, a teacher who has student, thousands of students worldwide, and he is very much supporting research of these techniques, uh, like Dalai Lama inspired you. And uh, we are doing research on a, based on a questionnaire, which is uh, um, actually reflecting the uh, connection of people. We call it provocatively spiritual well-being. Actually, that's the name of the questionnaire by mm. Fisher and Gomez, which is uh, not uh, reflecting religiousness, but mainly the, connect the feeling of being connected. Mm -hmm. And we have really interesting results. We have longitudinal MRI data from about 400 people, subjects. And uh, it's interesting to me that actually the level of spiritual well-being which they reported in the questionnaires showed that some areas of brain are protected against atrophy, mainly the regions which are responsible for our free decision mm -hmm. from our social control, emotional control. So it's uh, Wonderful. really showing how That's important great. it is. That's so wonderful to hear what's much. going on here. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you for the comment. Uh, yes, please. First of all, uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, and the question, it w just let me repeat it, the essence of it, is it bad for our brains to be doing two things at once, like um, washing the dishes and l listening to the radio? So first, let me just clarify that, um, uh, w that in most cases, when we think we're doing multitasking, we're actually not. Um, so for the most part, I mean, not 100%, but for the most part, multitasking is a myth. It doesn't really exist. What we do is we rapidly shift uh, among the activities that we're doing, and typically at a cost. Now, you know, there are certain kinds of non-cognitively demanding activities, like washing the dishes, where listening to the music may be very much like doing a meditation practice, except when we do a meditation practice, we're intentionally changing our mind rather than leaving our minds to be shaped by whatever uh, messages we may be listening to on the radio. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think that that's a kind of multitasking where th that is possible because washing the dishes is not cognitively demanding. But if you're trying to do, uh, uh, if you're trying to read some material at the same time you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, that's a kind of multitasking, first of all, which doesn't exist. Uh, and second of all, uh, that would be toxic. It's, uh, so there are different, there are different types. Um, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, hello, Dr. Davidson. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question regarding uh, brain waves, specifically gamma waves, which you write about in your book, uh, Altered Traits, about how meditators who have more than 62,000 hours of meditation experience actually present higher levels of gamma wave um, at baseline. So just by being, they are experiencing more gamma waves. Um, what I've read is that, um, well, it currently isn't known how neurons are able to tune in to the different frequencies of, uh, of the different types of waves that exist. I was wondering if you had, oh, well, that was my first question. Do you have any comments on that? And secondly, I've also read that um, gamma waves occur at a frequency that theoretically is too high for neurons to actually uh, sort of fire in tune with gamma waves. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I'm just 
curious as to whether or not you know anything about that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. First of all, just a little brief sort of pedagogical moment. Um, when we record brain waves from the human scalp surface, they are essentially, they have nothing to do with the neuron firing. So um, when a neuron fires, that's called an action potential. Brain waves are constructed through, not through action potentials. So action potentials do not directly contribute to the oscillations that we see on the scalp surface. What is the critical contributor are synaptic potentials. They're totally different than action potentials. Synaptic potentials uh, occur in the absence of action potentials. They are related in an indirect way to action potentials, but they're completely different biophysically. Um, and so, uh, 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 and they're summated postsynaptic potentials is essentially what we record when we record oscillations from the scalp surface. And, um, uh, and so uh, these, uh, I mean, there's abundant neurophysiological evidence to su suggest that these postsynaptic potentials can occur in the gamma frequency. They, it's been documented in animal neurophysiology extensively, and so there's a robust scientific literature for this. Um, uh, gamma oscillations are particularly important uh, in a number of different kinds of situations. They're important for synaptic plasticity. Um, they promote synaptic plasticity. W the thing that is most unusual about what we have recorded is the synchronization of gamma oscillations across widespread regions of the brain. And we don't exactly know what the significance of that is, uh, but uh, the phase synchrony of gamma oscillations has been linked in other kinds of work to what, what has been called perceptual binding or binding more generally. And binding refers to different elements of a mental construct coming together. Uh, and so at a very simple level, imagine that you are biting into a juicy red apple. If you can imagine that there is a visual component, there's a tactile component, there's a gustatory taste component. There's an auditory component. All of them come together in this image. Uh, and when you, if you did that, you would see a burst of gamma oscillations that would be synchronized among the different brain circuits that are important for each of those elements, among the tactile, the visual, the auditory. Uh, and that gamma, the, the, the synchrony reflects these different elements of a person being bound together. And so in the meditators, the, the phase synchrony that we see, we think is correlated with the phenomenological quality of this panoramic awareness that they report where all the different elements of their experience are held uh, in the experience. There's nothing that is ignored. It's all fully present. Uh, and so uh, there's still a lot that we need to learn about that, but that's kind of our current thinking about it. Um, okay, so here. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Kumon. I have actually two questions, if it's okay for you. The first one is regarding the experiment uh, done on younger children, like newborn or infants, uh, where you had the two puppets, actually, and you were giving them the choice to choose between those, do the hostile and friendly one. Uh, for those percentages, like I think it was five or six percent, if I'm not mistaken, um, do you have more information, like so socializing information of those children? Where are they actually coming from? And the second question is regarding to your use of term of altruism as to the strictest sense, it's more or less, depending on your science of thought, not possible, let's say frankly. As not possible. Not possible, the strictest sense of altruism, that something, or it depends on how you see altruism, therefore I would like to ask you to explain in which way you de determine altruism. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the second question. Um, how you define altruism. How I define altruism, okay. <coughs> um, with respect to the first question, um, there's not a lot that's known about the small percentage of infants that don't show the normative preference. This is something that still needs to be investigated. Uh, um, so we certainly have conjectures about what might cause that, but we don't really know at this point in time. Uh, with respect to how altruism is defined, I mean, it's been defined different ways by philosophers, psychologists, and evolutionary biologists. Uh, 
uh, altruism is often defined uh, uh, as um, uh, uh, in a way that is uh, costly. That is, if, if, if there's benefit to oneself in engaging in an altruistic act, there are some philosophers who would argue that that's not altruism. Um, my own view is that that's ridiculous um, because it flies in the face of everything we know about human biology and psychology and contemplative practice because the, the most um, direct kind of uh, and simple way to um, uh, increase well-being is through generosity. And so when we are generous to others, there's benefit to ourselves. And if we a priori rule that out and say that that's not altruism because it's benefiting ourselves, it's just completely ridiculous. Um, it, you know, it, 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 it flies in the face of everything we know about, about genuine generosity. Uh, and so uh, that philosophical argument has been made, but I think it's completely an impoverished argument because it doesn't, I mean, the Dalai Lama is, is another is example of someone who engages in altruistic acts all the time, but he'll tell you that it gives him a warm-hearted glow. Are we going to dismiss those acts of altruism? So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I really want to appreciate uh, the lighter message you put across that uh, mm, we can support, we can train our brains to feel well. Mm, because my field um, here at the, at the Masaryk University is in wellness, in how we can flourish in our life. And what I struggle the most with is the cultural difference uh, in trying to put the message across. So what I would... Um, uh, like uh, to invite you to is to maybe sh share your insight how to mm, really in the practical matter share the theoretical knowledge uh, to people like us so that we can mm, apply them in our lives because in my uh, experience uh, after falling in love with wellness and well-being discovering all the knowledge and all the science we have <coughs> I started lecturing about it and what happens is typically that people, when they listen to this beautiful information, they say, yes, it's beautiful. And then we go home back to our normal lives and we forget. Absolutely. So how would you encourage us, because I'm originally a teacher, to put this across to our students and to our families yeah. maybe even, because yeah. this seems to be... I, I think it's a <laughs> wonderful question, really wonderful. And I have a few responses to it. Uh, um, those of us who are Americans um, have an iconic image of a very famous speech that Martin Luther King, the great civil rights activist, gave in the 60s in the U.S. And, you know, that was a time that was really terrible for race relations in the U.S. And the title of Martin Luther King's talk was not, I have a nightmare. The title of his talk was, I have a dream. It was holding the positive image of what is possible. And so the first thing I think we need to do is to use exemplars of what is possible. What, what can, how can human beings really be in this world in a different way? And let's use some great examples uh, to inspire us. And the second thing, which is a more practical thing, is it's very, very hard to develop a new habit. Really hard. You know, we know people make New Year's resolutions to do all kinds of things that never come to pass. Uh, we know that lifestyle issues like exercise has been difficult, although if you look and extra physical exercise is a very good example because if you look in the 1950s at the percentage of the population of many different countries who engaged in regular physical exercise, it's much less than today. And this is an example of where 
there has definitely been a cultural change of attitude that has led to real differences in behavior, where now many people, a much higher percentage of people, incorporate physical exercise as part of their weekly routine. And I've been using the analogy of brushing your teeth because I think that we need to start really modestly. So when, you know, the way mindfulness-based stress reduction is taught in the original form, there was an expectation that people do 45 minutes of practice a day. I think that's ridiculous um, because it's a prescription for failure. Uh, and one of the things that we don't know, and I think there's a reason we don't know this, if you you know, ask people in the MBSR community, show me the data on the number of people, uh, on the percentage of people that engage in a regular daily practice one year after taking MBSR. How many people here who do MBSR know the answer to that question? You know the answer? I, I actually don't think that we have an answer. I don't think the answer is known from any rigorous work. And I think there's, my, I'm very rarely cynical, but there, I, this is one <laughs> um, small piece of cynicism that I have. Uh, I don't think we know the answer because I don't think we want to know the answer. Um, I think the answer is going to be preciously small. Uh, and the reason is because 45 minutes a day is completely unrealistic for most people. Let's see what one of the things that we're doing now in our center is we tell people, we'd like you to practice every day. And we know that it's really hard. So we'd like you to choose an amount of time that you think you can practice every day for 30 consecutive days, even if it's just one minute. And we start with one minute. And we also say that you can do the practice while you're doing other things like commuting. And we see that when we do that, we're getting almost 100% of people who practice daily. Uh, and you can slowly build a habit that way. But I think we need to take it in really small incremental steps in ways that are more likely to guarantee success rather than failure and not have people struggle with their mind. We want people to be friends with their mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Professor, thank May, my colleagues. Um, my name is Lucia Klapacheva, and firstly, I would like to thank you so much for the lecture. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you made me personally very, very happy. Because <laughs> you, as a scientist, as a top-level scientist, uh, confirm things uh, which uh, we know, uh, not many of us practice, but which me personally, I was, as have been practicing in my life for more than a decade as I was uh, having a lot of uh, high political positions, high level of stress in my life and in personal life and everything. And I was introducing all that to my life and I saw the results in the practical life, which is kind of answer also to my predecessor. I actually am just finishing book on that, on self-discipline in life. And uh, however, I would like to ask something else. You are here today with us and uh, I would dare to ask that. You are living proof of what you are living proof of what you are saying to us. So I would be very much interested in what is your daily practice? <laughs> 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 what do you do in your own life? Because obviously you do. <laughs> I wish that people in our countries, in my country, in your age would be like that. But usually they're you know, in a much worse shape, which I do not want for myself. And I think nobody here does. So if you could just 
give us a little bit of insight into yourself. Thank you. I, um, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I, uh, I practice every day, and um, I, my practice is very important to me. I've been practicing. I went on my first meditation retreat in 1974. Uh, so I've been at this for a very, very long time. I still regard myself very much as a beginner, <coughs> um, but I've been doing it for more than 40 years. Uh, and um, uh, so I, you know, I do a bunch of different kinds of practice. Uh, I, uh, uh, and I have someone who is someone I consider my teacher who helps guide me. Uh, and I practice in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the most important thing to say about it is that it's, um, it's something that is very much a part of my life. And, uh, and e at this point, even more important than the formal practice is the informal practice. Uh, and we were talking about this over coffee earlier, um, I think the word mindfulness in the West, and particularly among researchers, has really gotten corrupted. Um, what mindfulness meant in the original uh, contemplative tradition was re it, it had a connotation of remembering. And what, it, what is it that's being remembered? What is it that's being remembered is a certain view to bring to every encounter. And it's a view that includes regarding other people uh, as sharing the same wish to be happy and to be free, free of suffering, seeing innate basic goodness in every person, um, even in people whose actions we may despise, being able to see them uh, as having seeds of innate basic goodness. Uh, that's what mindfulness is, it's remembering. And you know, rather than being non-judgmental, it's actually quite discerning because it's focusing on these values. And so I think that you know, practice for me has become much broader and expansive and to include you know, as much as everyday life as possible. And with meta-awareness, uh, you can actually be doing practice, intentional practice, as you're doing anything else. And so right at this moment, uh, I can recognize through meta-awareness uh, what it is that is occurring. Uh, and so, you know, that's a little bit of sort of my daily practice. But, you know, then I talked to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He practices for four to five hours a day, every day. And he's been doing that since he was maybe seven or eight. Um, it's kind of daunting, <laughs> really inspiring. Hello, yeah, sorry, it took me here. Uh, one, one second. Sorry. Yes. Uh, hello, nothing? Yes, it's on. Okay, um, I have a because you showed some suicide rates or something, so is, is it a marker of how aware or how healthy you are, right? This suicide rates, because my it's question is, is there a corrupt, uh, how do you say, correlation between as, as the society moves towards uh, secularism, maybe we should have one more question. Uh, yeah. Less religiousity or spirituality, if you call it that way, the more the society becomes less aware or less uh, mentally healthy. And then the second question is that, do you believe that the human consciousness is a tragic misstep of evolution? Because we have to, we have to pay suffering because of this. So that's my two questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let me just answer the second question in the interest of time. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I don't think the human consciousness is, what did you put in a mistake? A tragic mistake a of evolution. Yeah, I think it is a, um, I would regard it as a, uh, uh, a wondrous gift of evolution, uh, that we have this capability 
that is far greater than any other species. Uh, and we have the capacity to transform our own minds and brains in ways that, I mean, I think this is probably the single most important distinguishing feature between the human brain and the brains of other species. Uh, and it is really about human consciousness. Uh, and so I think that this is a gift that we all have. And my <coughs> deepest aspiration is that we not squander this gift. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, so my question was actually relating to that one before as well. Because I was wondering, you had the, this um, test, like with the painful stimuli and the people anticipating afterwards. And I was thinking that's actually a good thing in the evolution. And similarly, for example, in the research in the Second World War with the Holocaust people, afterwards, they were more prepared for the changes and they were more able to survive like critical conditions and stuff. So I just thought it's actually also good because you're anticipating, you're observing the environment and doesn't actually meditation go against it. And when you bring the attention always to yourself, doesn't have also have like, doesn't it have also some side effects and can you overdo it? <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you for asking that. And a few, you raised some important issues that, that are useful to clarify. First of all, meditation is not about bringing attention to yourself. If that's what is conveyed, that's really a kind of complete misconstrual. Um, it's not about bringing attention to yourself. If anything, it's about bringing attention to others. So when we put our butts on the cushion, we invoke the intention that we're doing this practice not primarily for ourselves, but recognizing that if we have a calm mind and an open heart, it's beneficial to all the other people that we interact with. We're really doing it for them more than we're doing it for us. That's what it's about. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about we. So is it then enabling you more than like to observe the environment and like adapt for the changes? Then? Yeah, and in terms of anticipation, it's not about getting rid of anticipation. Anticipation is an important element of human brain function that we can anticipate, but there are different ways to anticipate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it doesn't help things to start feeling pain before the pain actually comes on. Mm -hmm. We can know that it's coming on without getting all riled up about it. So it's really about the nature of the anticipation, the quality of anticipation, it's not about getting rid of anticipation. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all very much.